services meeting for Monday, November 2nd, 2020. Um, I'm going to read our executive order here as a result of the executive order issued by Governor J.B. Prisker, suspending in-person attendance requirements for public meetings. City council members and city staff will be, will be participating in this meeting remotely. Due to public health concerns, residents will not be able to provide comment in person, but those who wanted to make comments could sign up on the city email list. I believe we have commenters already. Um, so I will call on you at the appropriate time based on the topic you want to speak on. Do we have to vote on that, Nicola? Yes, we do. Okay, can you please call the roll? Or Thank actually, you. I motioned that. Can I get a second, I guess? Second. Please. Second. Thank you. Okay, Alderman Fisk? Yes. Alderman Braithwaite? Yes. Alderman Rue Simmons? Yes. Alderman Ravel? Yes. Alderman Fleming? Yes. I see that motion carries. Thank okay. you. Next is HS1, which is approval of minutes from the regular meeting. Um, this is for action. These minutes are from October 5th. I move approval. Second. Second. Thank you. Nicola, the roll, please. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Thank you. Uh, next is public comment, but I thought in this committee, don't we take comment with the topic item? You can. Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll do it that way. So um, let me see. I have to go back to that list. So HS1, looks like we have no topics. Uh, Ottoman Ruth Simmons, can you move HS1, please? Yes, HS1. Resolution 90R20 designating the portion of Church Street between Darrow Avenue and Dodge Avenue with the honorary street naming sign of Clifford James Wilson Way. The Parks and Recreation Community Service Board recommend adoption of Resolution 90R20 naming that portion of the street after uh, Clifford James Wilson's Way. I move approval. Second. Any discussion? Um, there was, oh, go ahead, Simmons. Yeah, just discussion, um, requesting support of this. Uh, Pastor Clifford Wilson um, established and founded the church, uh, Mount Pisgah, there at that corner um, many years ago, maybe more than 30 years by my memory. And uh, outside of the, the faith community, he has served uh, many in need uh, in the Fifth Ward and beyond um, through clothing drives and other uh, charity and philanthropic efforts, um, as well as being a chairperson of Evanston Own It, um, one of the founding members there, working on violence reduction strategies, supporting our uh, summer youth job program, and being an overall pillar of the community and a leader uh, searching or, or providing um, unity and wellness and safety and uh, progress. So I'm hoping that we can support the street naming sign. There should be some letters of support. If they're not with this packet, then I'll make sure that they carry along with the um, council agenda when it goes there. <clears throat> Any more comment? There was no public comment. I don't remember seeing the letters, but um, I plan to support this. Mr. Wilson is always very kind, always very positive. Um, I think this is well deserved. Absolutely, and I would chime in as a resident of the second ward. Uh, Elder Wilson is well respected across town. His years of service probably equal all of ours combined. So I couldn't think of a better uh, honor to, to pass along to he and his family. All right, Nicola, can you call the roll please? Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. All right, that motion carries. Next we have HS2. Looks like we have one commenter, but I'm assuming this is, she wants to comment on the other HS2. Um, do we have Jennifer Harlovitz on the line? Yes, the other HS2. Okay, all right, I thought so, thank you. It's hard when there's two different ones. All right, so this HS2, Autumn Ravel, can you move HS2? Somebody else could, I can't, I mean, I've got it on a different screen. Okay, 
I'll do it real quick. HS2 is Human Service Committee 2021 meeting dates. Staff recommends approval of 2021 meeting dates, which are laid out in our packet. For action. Second. Second. Thank you. Nicola, can you call the roll, please? Uh, Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Raithwaite? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. So that motion carries. Uh, next is HS3. We have several speakers lined up for this. Alderman Braithwaite, can you move it forward in action and we'll have the speakers come after you? Yes, Alderman Fleming. Give me just one quick second to get out of the and go straight to the <clears throat> thank you for your patience uh h3 is for action staff recommends the human services committee review and approve a proposed community member relief fund which would provide emergency assistance through the city of the city's general assistance office to undocumented evanston residents I will second that. Um, we have, I think, three speakers here, so I'll just go in order of which they signed up. The first is Rebecca Mendoza. Rebecca, you'll have three minutes to address this. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to the members of the Human Service Committee. Uh, my name is Rebecca Mendoza. I am the current president. Um, it's asking me to start my video. Um, again, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rebecca Mendoza. I am the current president of Evanston Latinos, um, a recently formed nonprofit um, who since seven, uh, 2017, we are a group of Latino leaders in Evanston and we've been advocating to city officials as well as other large institutions in Evanston, urging them to provide specific resources, support um, to the Evanston Latinx and Spanish speaking community. Um, in early 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic began to accelerate, uh, it became clear that there needed to be an organization working to support and advocate for the Latinx community. Two months into the pandemic, um, as the positivity rate for our Latino community hit 18.3, while we're only 11.8% of the population, uh, we decided to form uh, as a nonprofit, and so we were fun founded. At the time of our founding, uh, many community members were unable to find resources in Spanish to help them understand the terrifying unfolding events and oftentimes strict requirements to apply for assistance. Uh, due to the city's historically underinvestment in the Latinx community um, and outreach and the building of relationships, there's a general sense of um, distrust in addition to fears of public charge uh, by our community undocumented uh, folks, immigrants, and mixed status residents. In order to find support and access for these resources, many of the residents reached out to us on Facebook uh, through a closed group called Evan Echos and Evanston in search of resources, information, and general assistance. Uh, the lack of access uh, policy at the, language access policy, I'm sorry, at the city has caused many delays in relaying critical information to the Spanish speaking residents of, our, of Evanston. With a uh, short term assistance from the city of, um, from the Evanston Community Foundation, we were able to hire a community outreach person to assist with things such as applying for general assistance, housing assistance, mm -hmm. registration for SNAP benefits and healthcare services, food security and online assistance. Um, as a new organization, we are limited in our capacity to fill the many needs of this population and support the city making the service and hopefully others available to undocumented residents um, as some of which are longtime residents having lived in Evanston for 20 uh, plus years. Um, we are witness to the need for this community member relief fund. And so we hope that you will be in full support. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, next we have Stephanie Mendoza. Hi everyone, thank you for your time today. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of, um, in support of the Community Member Relief Fund and I hope that the um, committee can, the Human Service Committee can support the fund as well. Um, I am a community outreach um, 
organizer for Evanston Latinos, and I've also work at Connections for the Homeless. And um, due to the pandemic, we've seen increased um, demand for services among um, undocumented residents here in Evanston. And um, like many Evansonians, they have reached out to the city to try to access the general fund, the emergency fund, but we found it um, that it's a barrier to undocumented family um, due to the requirement of a social security number. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with Ike and um, and I appreciate his response to um, to our our, um, you know, after speaking with him and telling him on um, the issues that we've been facing um, regarding uh, applying for emergency and general assistance. And um, this fund would help support longtime Evansonians who are raising their kids here and have their children um, in our schools and are finding it hard to stay in Evanston or get other emergency assistance due to um, the requirement of a social security number. Um, I hope the committee can can support this fund. Like you know, we have many undocumented um, residents here in Evanston that come from many different countries and speak many uh, languages. And, you know, as a wel welcoming city, I think it would speak to to us as a as a community, um, having this fund will will only embrace uh, you know embrace people and truly um, help our city uh, be the welcoming city that it strives to be um, for all people. Um, and thank you, Ike and Indira, for putting um, this together. And I hope the Human Service Committee can can fully support um, this fund. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, next, we have Megan Shea. Uh, looks like maybe Megan Shea is not on the line. Oh, actually, you know, she provided a written statement of support. I'm just, now I can see this. Um, I guess I'm supposed to read this. We'll read her written statement. This is from Megan Shea of the Fourth Ward. I wanted to share my statement of support of the proposal to create an emergency assistance program for undocumented families before the Human Services Committee today. I live in the Fourth Ward and wanted to make sure it is clear that me and my family are in full support of this program creation for undocumented families here in Evanston. We would we need to work collectively to support all of our community members. Our undocumented families are incredibly important to the community and have been treated as invisible for way too long. Let us come together and raise the needs and voices of our precious undocumented community that works so hard and deserves so much more. So that can go into the notes. All right, so this has been moved and seconded. So do we have any discussion from the committee? Sounds, sounds like a very important program. I'm, I'm glad we can do this. Yeah, and I, if I could, Share just a, a thank you to speakers, uh, Rebecca, Stephanie. Uh, earlier in the pandemic, uh, I, I sat with, uh, there was a committee that was actually formed that, that Rebecca talked about to address these issues. And so when you think of all the people, the restaurants that are suffering, uh, our citizens that you hear from every day, at the bottom of that list are people who don't have documentation and that are undocumented. And so you've given the last four years of a crazy administration. I'm just really excited that we were able to to take this on. So the Evanston Community Foundation has been assisting through private dollars. And I think this is just amazing that our city staff has pulled together. And thank you very much, Alden Fleming, uh, for your role. So for Ike and Dira, Kelly that's on the phone, as well as the supportive city manager, uh, Erica Storley. I think this is just wonderful for that community. And I hope that we use this as a moment when folks criticize, you know, the fact that we don't pay enough attention to the folks in need. Clearly, we can't do enough. I want to be clear about that. There's always going to be more need. But the fact that we've carved out some resources to address this community says a lot about the city of Evanston and I would challenge anybody on this 
call or who will hear this or watch this video to find another town that tries our best to take care of our most vulnerable people. So thank you all. Look forward to voting on this. Thank you. Just adding my um, thanks. Thank you for your, the community advocates that have um, seen this through and made it possible. It's been a collective effort. Thank you to all that's involved. This is so important and I can't wait to vote yes on it. And then um, there's been there's been a change since I don't want to say change, but um, an addition we need to make um, since the memo came out. Um, as Autumn Braithwaite said, he and I sat on the undocumented task force, and the advocates really did um, ex explain the need in a way that I didn't necessarily know existed. Um, and so meeting with Ike and Sarah, we met with Kelly, and um, the, the staff really was great. And, and the manager Storley had. Um, there was some funds designated for the food pantry and as we know the city um really came together and gave financial support to the food pantry um and so she agreed to use that funding for this program so i can you please just update us on that because the memo reads that this is going to be all donations from the city but that is not totally true at this point absolutely good day members of the human services committee uh this is ike Ogbo, director for the health and human services department uh, there has been a $25,000 allocation from general funds in order to execute the, this program. Um, typically, uh, the U.S. code prohibits local governments from using tax dollars or city funds uh, for such a purpose. Uh, we were able to locate uh, a section in the city, in, in, the, in the federal code, where we can use such funds, especially right now, that we get in an emergency. And due to this fact, we're able to use this $25,000 from general funds for, for this purpose. So this is a program that we, of course, want to sustain. Uh, and we also have to think about the future once we are gone past this pandemic um, to sustain this program. And one of the avenues that we'll continue to explore will be donations. As it stands, we'll use some of the city funds to fund the program, and it will be supplemented by the nations as well. So to your point, Alderman Fleming will have to amend the memo to include the $25,000 um, allocation for, for this purpose uh, through the general funds. All right, thank you for clearing that up, and that's... Um... That's great. So when this goes to city council next week, ideally, if it, if it passes, then we will have funds set aside for people to start using right away, which is very important given the pandemic and all of the issues that we know people are facing as we look at more shutdowns um, locally. Any more comments after that last piece that I put in? All right. So seeing no more, uh, Nicola, can you call the roll, please? Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, let me see what's um, before we move forward, and if it may be in the memo, staff are to Ike, as, as the head of the Health and Human Services. Can you just share how this will be communicated to the public? Absolutely. Uh, the same way we communicated our pantry operations, we are going to also use that method in communicating this to, to the public. Uh, we'll use our communication channels. Uh, we'll go through a number of agencies that we know can reach our community members uh, who are undocumented. So um, when we put these communication channels to, together, I think we'll be able to broadcast this information so that our undocumented residents will be aware that the program of such exists. Perfect. And I, I know we were, and I apologize, my computer just died, so you're just getting audio right now. We heard uh, our, our, our Spanish-speaking allies did an amazing job with advocating. Um, can you make it clear that this is open to any and all undocumented uh, members of our community? Absolutely. Thank you. And I guess we talked about um, a few days ago, if you can 
um, as you're getting it out, if you can email it to myself, or Autumn Braithway, or even Rebecca Mendoza, who's the chair of the undocumented task force. Um, there are some, you know, lots of folks on there. I think there's about 10 or 12 people on there who all work with different populations um, through the schools and everything else. So that's probably a great place to make sure this information gets to. And Audrey Braithway and George Baptiste are on there as well. Sounds and if I could just give a shout out to the Evanston Community Foundation as well, who, again, through the efforts of those that are on the call, uh, I, I definitely have to take a moment to acknowledge Kimberly Holmes as well who uh, through her outreach, we were able to link in the Haitian and Jamaican Caribbean community. So a lot of, I think Alderman Simmons said it best, we have a lot of folks in our community paying attention to the right thing. So thank you very much, everybody. All right, those are all of our action items. We'll now move on to our items for discussion. The first one is HS1, which is an Arts Council presentation. Not sure which staff is. Oh, all right, Toby. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much to the um, to all of you for giving us a few minutes to update you on what's been going on in Evanston with regard to the Arts and the Arts Council. We did the same thing last year, uh, and I'm pleased to offer the update. Um, I'm going to share a screen with some um, with some pictures, if I may. Um, you seeing those? Lovely, thank you. So um, it's it's really been extraordinary to see the way that the arts have kind of still come forward, risen to the fore, and our Evanston artists and um, and arts organisations have really risen to the occasion of the pandemic. And I'm going to spend a few minutes just showing a very small sample of what's been going on, and then brag very briefly on what the members of the Arts Council and the staff have done to help. Uh, after that, I'd love to update you on what we've done to reimagine our grants, particularly in the light of the, the ravages of the pandemic and the increased focus on issues of racial equity in the city and in the country. And finally, uh, we'll end by looking forward and inviting you to our Bright Night for the Arts, which we'll be holding virtually in a couple of weeks' time. So what you're seeing there is just one example of the way people in Evanston have really harnessed the technology and found ways to play music together whilst being physically apart, one laying down a track and then other people building on it. This is Funkadaisy, um, led by Rahul Sharma. Uh, or to perform from home, whether it's the Evanston Symphony in one corner there, or uh, an absolutely wonderful performance by members of the North Shore Concert Band, um, where they play a tango for flute and bar tools. And if you needed any further reason to come to our Bright Nights for the Arts, you get to see that video in full. So please do come and see that. It's wonderful. Uh, and then people have learned to multitask in extraordinary ways. Um, Howie Godfrey of ETHS uh, playing, I think, about seven different instruments all together there. Don Kagan of the Evanston Symphony doing the same thing with various forms of trumpet. People are taking their, uh, their music and their art outside, socially distanced appropriately um, in various venues and various musical forms. They're taking the ballet quite literally to the beach with the Evanston Dance Centre and the Evanston Dance Ensemble. And celebrating murals, some of them new, some of the existing. Um, uh, Art Encounter uh, ran a wonderful programme of a virtual tour of some of the existing murals from EMAP. Um, Teresa Perod down in the corner there uh, has been painting garage doors. Um, I'm determined to get in a list and, uh, and see if I can make a contribution to get mine done, not with council money, but my own. Uh, and that wonderful strength and diversity mural there. I um, have to give a shout out to Malena Aponte Matthews, principal of Doors School, who, you know, while being the principal and running a school 
the pandemic, which is probably a fairly time consuming undertaking, she also found time to come to the Arts Council, um, get a little financial support from us, find members of the community and get that fabulous mural uh, up in Dawes School just a couple of months ago. And you can see a couple of the members of the community and students helping with the painting of that down in the corner. Um, there's been amazing art just spontaneously done in the streets. You're seeing Indira um, Johnson's there and uh, some, some of the work that Evanston May did with Evanston Connects where, yes, we've all got very important lawn signs on, on our lawns um, headed towards tomorrow, but art lawn signs as well with some, some love to pass around uh, is another great outpouring of art. And people have really utilized the sidewalks and the studio, store and retail windows to have displays that people can see without having to go inside. Uh, we've had tons of those and Everson Art Connects has done a great job of spreading the word about those. And obviously on the streets, some very important messages being painted. Um, ETHS basketball on Dodge with Black Lives Matter, Emerson Art Center in their side lot, some of the work that Ben Blunt has been doing. And in the, in the streaming media with Rick Ferguson of um, the musical Offering, uh, B, our own BJ, uh, Arts Council member uh, uh, of North Light, uh, fabulous three nights of uh, COVID raising money by ETHS and perhaps the most impressive individual effort in the streams there being the work that Kamen Hendricks has done to celebrate Juneteenth virtually, uh, complete with a Zoom performance directed by Tim Rose of Fleetwood Dordain. The kids have not been forgotten. Um, we have uh, a wonderful program of royalty reads, setting up little free libraries with um, filled with books with um, BIPOC uh, role models in the literature uh, set up there. And six different organizations working severally and together who made efforts to distribute over 1500 art kits free to underserved kids stuck at home during the lockdown. So coming on now to what's the Arts Council been up to? Members of the Arts Council have tried to amplify that outpouring of art on social media. We've really ramped up our Facebook and Instagram presence and we repost and um, broadcast and applaud many of those um, of those art sharings that are coming from all over Evanston. Um, we've all had too much Zoom, but there have been a couple of really quite important meetings that we've ha held convening arts organizations and artists on issues of managing through the pandemic and of um, just dealing with our reactions to equity issues as they, as they hit the arts community and our arts endeavors. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we've got three new public art installations that have gone up in the last couple of months. We've worked with Chicago Sculpture International on a leasing program. They've been extremely helpful. And those three lovely pieces there in Iden Park, Quinlan, and I think our first ever, um, our first ever installation in the Fifth Ward at Twigs. So coming on to the last section, what have we done to reimagine our grants? Well, I remember very well that Alderman Braithwaite a year ago looked me in the eye, we were in person then, uh, and said that he was looking for the Arts Council to seek ways to augment revenue, not just spend the money. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that um, the indefatigable Paulina Martinez um, did a fabulous job of applying successfully for an Illinois Arts Council matching grant um, to match to a 50% level, the 20,000 that we were able to release from our otherwise frozen funds. So the cultural fund was able a few months late to get going. And we've overhauled that very significantly in the light of both the pandemic and the heightened focus on racial equity. 
We've had an equity working group with seven BIPOC members and two white ones um, who have been working with us for over a year now. And we adopted all of the input that they brought forward, which was really four main things to make the grants more inclusive and bring a more equity lens to that whole program. Firstly, community arts groups were invited to apply for the first time. It had been um, only available to 501c3s before, which really rather ruled out some of our grassroots organizations um, and had an unintended consequence of making it a rather white group that applied in the past. We streamlined the questionnaire to three questions rather than the previous seven narrative questions to make it more accessible and honestly, because our arts organizers are so busy just keeping things going during the pandemic. Um, very importantly, we announced in advance that applications from black, indigenous and people of color, both organizations and programs serving them would be favored for these grants. And our judging panel was predominantly BIPOC, uh, six out of the eight members. So what did all that do? Well, we're pleased to say there's always more to be done, but we're pleased to say that they made a real difference. Our applications for the Cultural Arts Fund went up by 65% this year. 60% of those had never applied before. The same budget of 30,000, 10 of which came from, as I say, the Illinois Arts Council, was distributed to 21 grantees rather than 12 last year because the Arts Council was determined to spread the spread what was available amongst more people. 43% of those grantees have never applied before. And really the bottom line, the metric that we feel most pleased with is that this year, 71% of the grants went to BIPOC organizations or projects primarily serving BIPOC or underserved populations. That means that 15 out of the 21 grants went to BIPOC organizations whereas only three did out of the 12 last year. So we feel that we're heading in the right direction with that work and we'll certainly continue. The equity uh, working group um, is determined to keep working together uh, and see what else we can do to bring that equity lens as thoroughly as possible to all the work of the Arts Council. Uh, these are the organizations, 21 organizations that um, we were able to make grants to under that program. And finally, looking forward, uh, the main thing that I wanted to do, and also James Deeb, who is the um, vice chair of the Arts Council and is also on the call, was to thank you for your continued support, um, uh, to ask you, even in a year where budgets are so constrained and there are so many needs, to continue to support the arts as we move into the budget process for next year. And let's celebrate the absolutely vibrant artistic community that we have here by please joining us for what this year will be a virtual bright night for the arts um, that's where we where the mayor will present the mayor's awards for the arts it'll be held on thursday the 19th at five o'clock it'll take just over half an hour and we'll have zoom and streaming details which we'll forward to you in, in in the next week or so but thank you so much for everything that you do to support us um, and for the time to just give you a very brief update of what's been going on, what the Arts Council has been up to. If there are any questions at all or comments, um, I would love to take them now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Toby. I would just say that was a very impressive um, turnaround from last year. I think when I first got here, I, we were talking a lot about murals and you know, it's really big projects and it's, it was neat to see the pictures and see so many smaller projects that are still just as tangible to the community. And I know that several of the families really like the bunny that's over here in the ninth ward. So, so thank you for that. Any more comments from the committee? I do. Um, so this is Alderman uh, Robin Rue Simmons and just thank you. Thank you to the entire Arts, Arts Council. As Alderman Fleming said, the expansion of the uh, services that have been delivered, the creativity, the innovation, um, the new commitments to uh, the Fifth Ward have been certainly appreciated and celebrated. We love our uh, new art installation in Twitz Park. We love the murals. 
Uh, we really appreciate the grant awards uh, for this year's uh, arts grants and how that's going to expand really important programming like the Juneteenth Parade, like Evanston Made, um, and so many others. I have grown to really appreciate uh, the arts and how it is a community benefit, a community development benefit. It improves our aesthetics. It's just really enriching. And I can't thank you enough for uh, being so responsive. Um, even the coming uh, Black Lives Matter installation, I understand that's being held up, but really appreciate that you have figured out a way to um, have a permanent Black Lives Matter uh, art installation. So thank you very, very much. Actually, uh, Honorable Ruth Simmons brought that issue up about the Black Lives Matter signage. Is there something that we can do on our side if we're interested in helping move that along? Is it still kind of stuck with the CTA approval process? Do you know, Toby? Hi. Oh. Yes. No, uh, I, I can speak to that, Alderman Fleming. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Paulina Martinez. Uh, sorry, my camera is not quite working right now. Um, so, uh, not really to answer your question uh at this point we've also missed uh, the mural season uh it would be kind of hard to to paint a mural right now um it is something that i'd love to talk to you about fine if you if you have more questions but uh uh it, it's going to come down to us finding an alternative wall for that specific mural uh um but um yeah we, we can talk about it more offline if, if you'd like to, okay. to know more about that all right, thank you. All right, Toby, well, it looks like there's no more questions or comments, so thank you so much for that update. Thank you. All right, next is HS2, Ottoman. Um, this, can you bring that one in? And then we have a couple commenters for it. Uh, yes, I don't have my... Oh, okay. I, I'll I'll do it. No problem. Okay. HS2 is the banning outdoor games involving the consumption of alcohol, that can be viewed from a public right of way or adjacent property. Ottoman Fisk recommends city council review and discuss an ordinance banning outdoor games that would involve the consumption of alcohol that can be viewed from public way and adjacent property. Um, this is just for discussion, so we don't need to move. I'm gonna call, I think we have two speakers for that. Um, Jeremy Veneta. There, Jeremy here. All right, looks like maybe no. Well, Jeremy uh, had, he was a I don't see Jeremy. Karlovitz. Hi. Um, so um, I'm opposed to um, prescribing how people should behave. I'm opposed to um, inviting the police into people's lives. I'm, I'm opposed to inviting police into uh, neighbor disputes. Um, and I, 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 what I, what I really want to talk about is what I do want, which is a way for neighbors to um, settle conflict um, that doesn't involve police. And I don't know what that is. I would uh, love to be involved. And I, that's really why I'm speaking. And um, actually, sorry, sorry, going back to what I don't want, um, I think when the police get involved, it's, it's, it's inefficient and it's dangerous and it's expensive. And, um, the current budget, as I understand, is 55 million for police. And, um, so I, I would really like to reduce that. And I would like to be part of, I'd like to see us settling disputes without the police. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have more to offer at the moment other than my excitement for that. So thanks for listening. Thank you. My next speaker is Julie Johnson. Hi. Yes. Um, um, I appreciate what the last speaker had to say. Um, and I also want to start out by saying I'm, I'm here to support the ban on uh, alcohol games, beer, pong in particular. Um, and uh, it might sound like this is a trivial topic, but if you're living where I live, which is really close to the university, 
Um, it's a huge topic. We've been here for 24 years and it's been, we've enjoyed peace and quiet. And I, um, I just want to say that it, it, it's a fundamental desire of all people that where when you come home, you're able to have peace and quiet. Um, and what's been starting to happen in our neighborhood is making it very difficult to have peace and quiet when you come home. And, you know, if you're not living in this neighborhood, you're not really understanding that. We're talking about student houses that are full of people aged 19 to 22, never lived outside the home, um, alcohol is available, and now they're playing games. That's the new thing, games. Beer pong, all kinds of games that involve drinking and winning and competing. And what you have is you have people screaming and yelling when they win a point or when they lose or something like that. And it's really upping the ante on the kind of activity that happens at student parties. And, you know, it's, it's making it very difficult to enjoy, um, you know, life on our block. Uh, our block came to the city council a couple of months ago asking for down zoning because we've been, we were wanting to keep students, uh, investors from buying the houses on our block and to, packing them full of students uh, and having these kind of drinking parties and we were turned down and so this is an option that's come up you know to try to address some of the worst of the behavior of the students and you know okay no down zoning fine what else can we do and this is one thing one of the worst things we experience is these kind of parties you know and um, that's why we're bringing it to you. That's why. That's why I'm really supporting it. Um, and I just would encourage people who don't live here to understand that it's a unique situation. It's not like a block where people are, you know, in their 20s or their 30s or their 40s or 50s or 60s. No, we're talking about families living right next door to a house full of 19 to 22 year olds. And they do not have, I mean, we, I have neighbors on my block that have been sworn at. You know, we've had, or, you know, when we've asked people to quiet down, we've talked to, um, we've, and, uh, you know, talked to landlords who are dismissive and uh, don't want to be bothered. So this is a suggestion. And I think it could have a powerful deterrent effect on some of the worst of the party behavior. So that's what I wanted to say. All right, thank you, Julie. And our last speaker on this topic is Sean Peck Collier. Hi, uh, I'm, I guess I'm really confused about why this is even up for discussion. Um, are we trying to make our town a dry town? I mean, this is about noise complaints. This is about Northwestern moving into Evanston residence. Uh, if the issue is with the students, call Northwestern and have them deal with it. Um, have those with, with the complaints uh, brought this to the student council or the Northwestern uh, administration? I mean, the ordinance as introduced in this agenda literally is talking about making drinking beer in a fun context on your own property or private property illegal if someone else can see it and takes an issue with it. So why? After everything that we have been seeing and the public conversation that's happening, as our older folks put it, are we even considering involving punishment or the police in this context? Not only is this a ridiculous concept to begin with, getting in trouble for having fun on your own property or, or private property for, you know, that you're renting, it's ripe for racial bias, as we are seeing with bike citations, traffic and pedestrian stops. I ask our older folks, please use your foresight and equity lens and nip this discussion in the bud. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, Autumn Memphis, do you want to speak to this? Sure. Yes. Um, 
Okay, well, I think I think Ms. Johnson um, said it uh, pretty pretty well. Um, this is a um, an issue that has been um, a problem for some time, both in my ward and in the fifth ward, um, probably more in the Fireman's Park neighborhood. But it is now spilling over as more houses are purchased by. Um, uh, investors and absentee landlords and basically unsupervised activities um, causing problems for uh, for neighborhood residents both in uh, the amount of nuisance and noise and and litter and um, just um, uh, difficult behavior um, and frankly the reason why um, I brought this to uh, the committee was, as you can see on the agenda for discussion, because I, I really don't know what we can do to help these neighborhoods um, that are clearly suffering. Um, now, the way it's been explained to me um, from one of the Fireman's Park neighbors is that uh, these parties, the drinking games, that are prohibited by Northwestern University. Their alcohol policy says none of these games uh, are allowed on campus. So, um, but when they spill over into the neighborhoods, what happens is that you can attract 50 to 100 or more students who not only fill the front yards, but the sidewalks and the streets and cause um congestion and and just all sorts of safety issues as well now in the for the 1900 block of orrington there is a dormitory 50 feet away across the street on orrington foster walker and then the, for the sorority quads that are just around the corner uh, literally just feet away on emerson so what you have are, are these games occurring, uh, 1945 Sherman, 1906 Orrington, and other locations um, within shouting distance of Northwestern uh, residence halls. And so they attract, they attract a large number of students who once they see the games, they come and join in. And, and um, so this is not, and I'm not in favor of, of our banning, um, any, um, anyone's quiet enjoyment of their property. And I absolutely appreciate, uh, especially in these days of COVID, um, people's use of their front yards to gather and asso associate with their neighbors. And I think all of that is wonderful. But that's not what we're talking about here. And so I don't, I'm not quite sure, um, and I would really value the committee's input on this because um, I mean, I could see trying to address the problem as making it contingent on a certain number of feet from a dormitory or residence hall, for example, um, like we set distance requirements for other uh, activities near schools. Um, I, if we can find a way to um, make this um, directly associated with the um, with the source of the problem, I think that's that's helpful too, or the source of the solution. You know, whatever. This does not mean, in my mind, that police are going to be showing up in someone's front yards and arresting people and telling them they're taking them off to jail. Um, this is, we wouldn't be here, I think, as a community if, if um, conversations were um, successful, uh, but they're not. And there are plenty of photographs to show, show you that what's happening right now is not working. Um, so again, as Ms. Johnson said, um, the uh, neighbors in my ward are looking for relief. 
um, what what I hear, and I assume Alderman Ruth Simmons has heard from neighbors in the Fireman's Park community are also looking for relief. We're just trying to figure out what that relief is. So if any of you have any real good ideas, I would be more than happy to hear them. I have a, I'm sorry, Alderman Fleming. I don't know how to raise my hand. So no, I, I saw your mute go off. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I fully support Alderman Fisk in uh, this request. And maybe we need to look at a way um, that is more appropriate because not only do I not want it to be another policing event, I don't want our police um, managing, uh, you know, social drinking of folks of a legal age. However, we have a serious uh, issue in our wards that we can't remedy with zoning and we shouldn't have to remedy it with zoning. And I do think that drinking games in the front yard of a family neighborhood is problematic. It's, I think I heard someone say fun and drinking and that's fine, but if we're having fun and drinking and celebratory uh, excess and drinking with youth in the neighborhood, I think that front yard activities like that is not uh, exactly family, family appropriate. Um, so in addition to the um, deteriorating exterior property standards that tend to go along with the uh, properties that have the drinking games and the, um, the volume and the quantity of folks that tend to gather at the place that have, have, the, have the drinking games, it's been um, it's been a nuisance to the neighbors, and we have to address it. And I think this is an appropriate way. Um, I can't say I looked at the details in which it's written up, but I would hope that it would be more like a, a property standard ticket or something more along those lines than than criminal. So that wouldn't be um, what I was I, I had in mind. Um, but something more like a some type of a property standard violation or some other nuisance violations and not criminal. But as far as we can see, it's a pretty limited part of the city, I think. So I think maybe me, maybe me and Autumn and Fisk are the only two that are receiving uh, the complaints and the distress from the residents. But this is a way that we can address something that's been a habitual problem long before I came on council and it seems like for many years. I don't know if Fish wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I, I'm just uh, sort of thinking, um, Kel Kelly, are you on this call? I thought Kelly yeah. was here. Um, here. Oh, there she is. Okay. So I, I, I'm thinking of a, of a couple of things. Um, I mean, my, my thoughts this afternoon were if we can tie this in to proximity to residence halls or um, maybe that's a possibility, although I, I'm, I'm not sure in the uh, end part is there. Um, I, I just don't know what distance requirements would be. Anyway, so that's one thought that I had. The other thought I had is that there are some um, there is at least one local landlord that I know of who is, she is very strict on what she will allow the occupants as the students in her houses to do. And I, I would love to make that prohibition part of um, lease requirements, but that would be a private, I think. Kelly, you need to help me here because I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying yes, to think of I don't know that we can require um, any ordinance to be adopted into somebody's lease agreement. We can okay, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a way that we can not impose restrictions on the entire city, but how we can target the problem areas in these two wards and give the resident some relief. If the if the issue from what I'm understanding seems to be stemming from student activity. And it's, you know, Northwestern has adopted a rule um, or a policy that drinking games are not allowed on campus. Right. You know, it, it seems strange to me that a student could walk across the street 10 feet and then partake in the same type of rule prohibition that their school does not allow. Um, so we could look at distance requirements to residence halls um, for starters. 
if that is if that is the main issue. It, the legit, I don't. The legitimate okay. governmental purpose here seems to be, you know, we have the safety issue, um, right? That noise complaint. I mean, this also involves binge drinking. is my understanding. So, which is probably, right. I, I would surmise, that's why the university has adopted that rule to prevent binge drinking activities, which are very dangerous to people. Um, so we'd have to look into a little bit more where the proximity is occurring in Northwestern, if that is the only area um, that, that we're noticing these types of issues. And, you know, I don't know if we're noticing this citywide or if this is just specific to certain wards. So I have a question. Um, if it is a violation of um, Northwestern policy, then can Northwestern not enforce their policy to their students off campus? They don't have a student conduct or, or, or some sort of student handbook in what is appropriate or not, and they can't. Okay, go ahead. It looks like you got to an answer, Judy, uh, Ottoman Fist. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, so um, on the Northwestern student conduct um, handbook, it talks about or prohibited and restricted con conduct under alcohol, um, it includes, and good reasons, um, includes um, uh, drinking practices or games that encourage participants to consume alcohol or promote intoxication, and any paraphernalia that supports such activities are prohibited regardless of age. And then it goes on down to, um, to specify more. Um, so I, I guess I would, I would ask the Division of Student Affairs. Um, I, I don't, what we have seen in the past is, is that the university and NUPD do not respond, I'm sorry for the dog, do not respond to these, these issues. Um, and which leaves uh, the students as um, City of Evanston residents living off campus is, is what it is. If they're not in a um, university uh, building, then these um, these principles do not apply. Um, <coughs> now, we were talking earlier this afternoon, Kelly, on a, on a different Zoom call with a different set of neighbors with who are also having student problems of slightly different nature, that Northwestern will respond in cases that are related to COVID and specifically not wearing masks or uh, engaging in, in behavior that's not consistent with their COVID policy. But that doesn't extend as far as I know, and I've spoken with Dave Davis about this, uh, does not extend uh, to this type of behavior. Although I have to say, I have called Dave uh, in the past on these and have, have requested that NUPD go and, um, and uh, talk with the students that rarely, rarely happens. Now, um, Aldrin Resumes, I don't know what um, your experience in the fifth ward is on this, but um, again, the the messages that I've that have been shared with me uh, from the fifth ward are pretty similar to what I've experienced in my ward, which is in NUPD is not not much of a help. Now, um, a few weeks ago, um, there was a an effort um, to go door to door and knock on doors in the fifth ward, requesting that students follow a certain kind of behavior um, that does not seem to have gone very far. So we're sort of left here holding the hat, trying to figure out, um, you know, how we help these folks who are, are really impacted by this. Um, I, th I think Northwestern is the responsible party and they're negligent. If they have a policy that says that their students can't do this, they should be enforcing it. And they shouldn't put that responsibility on us to change a whole, uh, make a whole ordinance about it because where does it end? I mean, say I want to have a glass of wine in my front yard and, right. and also play tic-tac-toe. Like, is that a, is that now become a drinking game? You know, so no. why is I... Northwestern doing more? Is someone from uh, Northwestern here to call? Move to Northwestern, may I speak? I just got on the Zoom. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, I called you earlier. You, you weren't here. Can you... Yeah. But we, I'll, nope. I will call on you before this topic's over to allow you to give your public comment. No, so not now. In a minute. 
yeah, we, as the the committee finishes up, I mean, just for discussion, so we're not going to vote on anything, but I would sure. like to have your public comment on one so, so is no one from Northwestern on the call, Dave or, or Tony or? No, there's no one that I'm seeing from Northwestern on the call, just based on the names here. Um, but I do agree. I mean, I, I, I empathize with the neighbors. I, I don't think this is a zoning issue. If there are some property standards issues, I think, you know, those are another thing. But I am concerned with, again, trying to set this. And I appreciate you, Audrey, this for saying you, you're trying. You don't think this is perfect um, because this just opens up, I think, a can of worms for other neighbors who <coughs> neighbors having a barbecue and you call and, you know, I think it unfortunately opens up a lot of things because I don't I don't know that we can hone it into just a certain demo, um, geographic area, but if it is a student code of conduct, even if they're off campus, they're still students. They're you know they're here to be students. Um, Northwestern has an entire police department and and many more resources that, than we have, and I don't know why I don't know how they operate in which they can say we're not coming to this house full of our students because it's not on you know our campus proper. I think that is negligent and. Um, I know that you guys talked about having a meeting with them after the last conversation around zoning. I'm not sure if that happened, but, um, and I don't know, you know, if we, we put our police in this situation um, or even our, our city staff, then it becomes the whole thing that we're picking on students and we're not student friendly. You know, I think it just, it, it opens us up for a whole lot of other grief that we don't need to have if it's limited really to beer pong at however many houses that we know are Northwestern students. Um, I, so saying that, I don't have a great remedy. Um, I think if it was a C ticket, it seems like you have enough neighbors that will call and we would gladly sign the C ticket. And that also then is putting more resources on us as a city to manage that part. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like Northwestern is large enough and has enough resources that they should be able to come to the table with something. I don't know if they have the capacity to write some kind of um, ticket for their students when they see them doing things even off campus. Um, Kelly, I understand what you meant about binge drinking, but I'm concerned with that would mean if we are going after some kind of binge drinking ordinance for people who are, you know, struggling and recovering alcoholics, if we're, you know, I just think that puts us in another kind of slippery place. And and the way this is written with, you know, kind of you can't be doing this activity anywhere where someone else can see you, that really just puts kids back in their house binge drinking or doing whatever games they're doing, which I imagine from Ms. Um, Johnson's point is still pretty loud, right? If, you got 20 19 year olds in the house drinking and partying. I imagine it's still loud for Ms. Johnson and the neighbors. So um, Judy, has Northwestern at all been helpful? I mean, I wanna think that they've been somewhat helpful or when people call Northwestern PD, they just say, well, we don't monitor because it's off campus. You're on mute, Judy. Sorry. Right, they 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 don't respond to these to these issues. These are considered to be off campus. Um, and remember, on um, Halloween night, they said our responsibility ends at the campus, and that's right. and that's 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 pretty much the the um yeah the the way the way that it is. I I I want to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to thank Kelly for. I mean, she came up with a wording from an ordinance in, in New Jersey, that that was not to be the Evanston ordinance. That was an ordinance that is a, you know, wording that, that is withstood, as I understand it, um, challenge. And that was a suggestion, uh, a suggestion that I don't think fits us here in Evanston because I don't want to, as I said, do something that is going to you know, affect the entire community. There are a lot of people who like to play, you know, alcohol-related games in their yards, and that's and that's fine. We don't want to we don't want to limit that. What we want to do is figure out how to address this problem. But I think all the wishful thinking in the world, and I'm more than willing to have more conversations with Northwestern. Uh, but I've had a lot of them, and all the wishful thinking in the world is not necessarily going to get them to come over and tell their kids to settle down or to follow university guidelines. Those university guidelines, and please go read them, I think I sent you all the link, those are specific to university-owned properties. This is not, we're not talking about university-owned properties. We're talking about properties in the city of Evanston, not owned by the university, but owned by absentee landlords who are not there to enforce 
uh, the behavior of their of the the tenants in their buildings. Now, most everywhere else where you have neighbors playing um, these games in their front yards, there's um, uh, some responsible adult around who is going to uh, be able to help if there's a situation or control a situation. This is not the same thing. And I think Alderman Simmons and I have been really, really struggling with how to, um, again, provide the neighbors some relief. So you can send us off as a committee, you can send us back to Northwestern, we can talk to them again, but we'll be back here in another month or two and tell you that that's not going anywhere. Now, I would love to be wrong, and I'm happy to take that, do that exercise, but somehow we've got to figure this out because this is, it is having a really devastating effect on the neighborhoods that are affected. And I think to, to say to the neighbors, you're going to have to endure this because we don't want to say anything, you know, negative that might be interpreted negatively towards students is sends the wrong message to our residents. I mean, somehow or another, we've got to figure out, um, again, how, how we can have, um, a dialogue on this that actually gets us somewhere rather than just keep talking and talking about it. Judy, uh, I want to jump in. I want to jump in because this isn't new. This has been going on for a very, very long time. I came into right. office hearing about this. Northwestern should have been here. They know that this is on the agenda. Dave or Tony or somebody that can answer to their student conduct and their handbook should have been here and not allow this to be our problem to manage. They see that it is causing a strain on our neighbors. There's desperate for mm -hmm. a solution considering down zoning and everything else. They should be here. They should be enforcing this. I, did, I was not even aware that there was already policy in their handbook. They should be enforcing their own policy. And I would like this to come back to committee with Northwestern staff present to give us some response on why they are not enforcing or some commitment that we can hold them publicly accountable to that they will enforce this if this is in their um, student handbook. Excellent suggestion. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm fine with that. I think that's a, that's a great idea. I'm just saying don't hold your breath, that's all. Well, we're, we've said it now publicly. We've tried to have meetings and we've done the email thread thing mm -hmm. and we've had ward meetings and everything else has been going on 20 years, maybe longer. So the next meeting, Northwestern needs to be here and they need to answer to why they aren't enforcing their own policies and it's disrupting our city. And they should um, they should join us in sharing this burden. Right. And they, they, see, they see how hard much how much problems this has been for us and how hard we've searched for remedies and they see how distraught the residents are. So they should come and I'm, I'm requesting publicly that um, who, whoever our staff person is on this committee request that Northwestern is here to talk with us um, so we can have a community discussion about it. I'm, I'm really happy with that. And, um, and I, I hope that we can come back at the, when is it, the December meeting? Um, first, uh, maybe, uh, first Monday yeah. in December? First Monday of December, yes. Okay. But Nicola, you have that then as our, um, this will can remain in committee with Northwestern staff present to speak on it. And I would say, make sure we probably have someone from the police department as well. So we have a better understanding of what they are doing. In addition to whoever else you all, you know, have as your liaisons. You mean from Northwestern police or? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. The Northwestern police. Well, and, 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 and administration. Okay. Yeah, because um, the annual city committee meets, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, I think third week of this month when we will probably be discussing uh, this there as well. Um, so for the neighbors, I would say uh, be sure to attend the, uh, this month's uh, annual city committee. All right. So Jeremy, would you like to go ahead with your public comment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Venata. I'm a 21 year resident of Evanston, uh, currently living in the first ward and thank you for calling on me to speak. I want to be clear that I'm here to oppose the proposed amendment to ban outdoor games involving the consumption of alcohol. I think let's first take stock of where we are today. Our restaurants are forced to shut 
our kids are sitting at home trying to learn via Zoom. Every interaction we have inside and out comes with a mask. Our shoreline is washing away. Our police are sitting with a bloated budget. Our city coffers are empty with more budget shortfalls coming. And Northwestern students are resorting to violence, demanding their own police department to be defunded. So I think the proposed ban is misguided and ill-timed. Let's first consider the legitimacy of the proposed ordinance. I think banning beer pong on personal property is likely a violation of an individual's right to privacy and personal autonomy under both US and state uh, of Illinois constitutions. In addition, the state of Illinois has not made it illegal to be publicly drunk. Last, the city of Evanston cannot demonstrate a compelling city interest to deprive individuals of such rights. What are you really seeking to ban? The consumption of alcohol or the noise associated with the games or the sight of a beer pong table in a front yard? We already have noise ordinances and open container laws that monitor gatherings like these. Next, let's consider where we are with our police budget, over $50 million. It's 13.5% of the total city budget and 35% of the general fund. Where the overwhelming sentiment in the city is to reduce the need for police to respond to incidents that would be better suited for another department. Our police force doesn't need to respond to these incidents. They don't need to spend time asking residents, socializing on their lawns if they're choosing to drink alcohol or if a game is making them do it. Our 911 call center does not need to hear from neighbors tattletelling on others who are gathering and playing on their lawns. <laughs> this is the exact opposite of what defending, defunding the police means. It's an archaic understanding of the purpose of police and will likely result in even more racial biases against gamers black and brown issues related to beer pong can be addressed as a community rather than utilizing our tax dollars to enforce it finally let's play this out if the ban is approved and we indeed do spend tax dollars responding to beer pong games breaking out across our city because neighbors don't approve of it and got the legislation passed what else could we ban toys left out on the lawn that are unsightly sprinklers that cross over to the sidewalk on a summer day sitting on the front, front stoop in nothing but a swimsuit, or like one of the aldermen said, having a beer and playing a game of tic-tac-toe. It's an overly paternalistic policy that feels more at home in the early days of uh, F.E. Willard Evanston than in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So you heard our discussion, so you know this will be back um, next week just for a discussion point. All right, our last item is item for consideration, um, review of Evanston Police Complaints and Comments Report. I think we have one speaker, Mr. Sean Peck Collier. Uh, good evening, Alder folks. Uh, please do not approve the Police Complaints and Comments Report. If you had time to review the report, you will see that the opinions of our Citizens Police Review Commission is not included in these reports. Now, every single department investigation and citizen, re uh, citizen registrar in the past has been accepted only after it has been received a determination from our oversight committee. Now, I would like to know why we are circumventing that particular process we've established and why, that these, why, why these are even on the agenda. This is literally the police policing the police at this point. To vote yes so accepting these is a slap in the face to every Evanstonian who asked for protection and a fair process in, when investigating police misconduct. This is why we got a new CPRC. To vote I only shows that the actions of this committee and our city council are nothing more than a performance. Please show us that you are better than that and do not accept these reports until our citizens oversight committee has had their say included. And um, speaking of performance, EPD has included, uh, has included what they call eight positive letters and comments received compliments, uh, complimenting the department's interactions with the community. I would like you to draw your attention to the fact that six of them are not from the Evanston community, but from other police departments of other communities. In the interest of transparency and a more accurate picture of community feedback, I ask one of our older folks to make the motion to no, long, no longer include the compliments of other policing institutions in their report. If these inter-police uh, inter department compliments are, don't present an issue to you, perhaps we should ask our Evanston neighbors who enjoy having alcoholic entertainment on their own property, follow their example and send you a report of the compliments they've sent each other. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sean. Um, I have, which, which staff is on the phone for this? Because I do want to address, I had the same question regarding um, a couple of the complaints. Is Chief Cook or is, I guess it looks like Chief Cook is on the phone? Yes, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. This is Chief Cook, Evanston Police Department. I'm here. Can you just, with, oh, well, okay, sorry. I'm I had here, a question for you. Here with Commander Glue and also with uh, Sergeant Warnick, both from the Office of Professional Staff. Okay, so I did ask the question, I was there earlier about the citizens review. So can you give us the answer for that, please, why they're not listed here? Yeah, they, they these were sent through the, uh, through the committee. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not attached on there. Yeah, so the, the final report is, uh, and I know we had discussed this, will be on the next one. Based on just trying to get the Citizen Police Review Commission up and running, uh, we had to get them training. They weren't able to make, uh, to, so we can get these actually done. If you notice, some of these are from the beginning of the year. We needed to get these through because we're almost a year out on some of these complaints because they just kept getting canceled and we didn't have the Citizen Police Review Commission. In the minutes from the Citizen Police Review Commission uh, is the discussion of all these cases. Uh, going forward, they will have uh, on all these summaries. And then these are just summaries of the cases. Um, and going forward, they will have the findings and recommendations. And also the HSC will be provided a report. And that is on the findings. Yeah, and it'll, the findings, it'll, it'll be uh, based on the Eugene Police Department and uh, Citizen Review Police Commission there, uh, that type of report. And uh, Kimberly Richardson is helping with that as well. So we'll have that for the next meeting going forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, these reports, I think one was from January, one was from February or so, so they are very old. Um, yeah, they old because, the, you know, the committee kept getting canceled, you know, they would cancel the meetings and then they were, we were in the process of uh, organizing the new citizen police uh, review complaint commission and then we had to get them trained, uh, that took some coordination. Uh, so now uh, those reports had been answered by us, we had reviewed them uh, and they had one to the, to the uh, committee and, and looked at they just it's just not attached right now but they didn't make a finding because of their training and such they, they they did actually make a finding and it's just they didn't complete the final report that is for the ordinance and that is something that has to be taken up with the commission it was just determined that it was going to go forward without that final report they did make a finding and their finding was on all three of the cases before human services tonight was that the investigation was thorough. They did not have feel that anything was neglected in these investigations. So, and like I said, it'll be available in the minutes for the CPRC. Okay, so that actually is different than I didn't know that, I thought that they just looked at them, but they did not make a determination because they were still going through the training process. But if they did make a finding, I do, I would like that, you know, added to the minutes of these, um, departmental inquiries as, as we've done in the past so that people if they're looking at them do know you know they have been through them and they did make a finding I wasn't aware that they had made a finding for our earlier yeah, conversation ma'am they just didn't provide a report with it yeah okay so I think the report is important mm -hmm. Agreed. Have. um I do have a comment after looking at the video for all three of these so di I think it's 2001 I can't remember the first digit I just have it written as 01 mm -hmm. um I, I do think that the finding of rule six, which again, I don't have in front of me, so maybe you can read it for us afterwards, and rule 20 are accurate. Um, there was the um, the gentleman, the one of the, I guess they both, there were two complaints, but the one complainant did ask about having some kind of um, ordinance or fine for the neighbor who he had the issue with and the officer didn't explain to him. He said, well, that would be a nuisance, but the officer did not explain to him that he did have an option of having a seat ticket for a nuisance written, um, which was what the resident was asking. Um, and so I think that that was, you know, missed on, on the policeman's part. And also the complaint did 
reference where the resident, the lady was threatened with being arrested if she continued to call the police. And I understand the police was trying to make the point of, you know, that she's a frequent caller. Um, however, I don't know that the rule is we, we arrest someone for calling the police too often. I understand that it is a misuse of resources and we're asking, you know, citizens not to do that, but him, him explaining to her that she would be arrested if she continued to call, uh, I, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but I don't think that that is something that we can necessarily do. So I would like that one to be, um, in my, my opinion is that when the finding was not correct in rule six and rule 12, he should have been found, you know, sustained or guilty. I'm not, I can't remember the terms you all use for that. And um, the other ones I thought that they were correct. Well, we looked at all three of them, you know, we'll take a look at the one you're talking about, but you know, when we have people constantly calling and calling back to back, you know, that constitutes disorderly conduct and it is a misuse of resources, but we'll take another look at it. Okay. And disorderly conduct though, chief, just so I understand, is that a arrestable offense? Is that a C ticket? Yeah, it's a, it could be a ticket. We could do it. It's a, it could be an ordinance ticket and it's also a state charge, but you know, we do a lot of ticket, <laughs> you know, it, it would probably be more appropriate to issue a ticket. Okay. And which, which again is, you know, I don't want to waste our resources either. And so maybe if he had explained that to her and that he could give her a, a ticket and she'd have a fine, but I think to just, particularly in the, the tone of voice he was using to threaten to arrest her for if she continued to call. Yeah, and that, that, that's the location that we, it's constant. I, yeah, it's constant. Uh, it's violence there, it's constant violence, it's, uh, it's domestic violence. So that's why maybe the officer took a little bit more of a harder stance, but we'll take a look at it, Alderman, and, and, and make sure we did everything in order. Okay, thank you. And so can we just, um, we don't need to review these again, but can you bring these back with the um, committee's findings, please, so that they're complete reports for the citizens and also for our records? Yes, ma'am. So we're having uh, HS or I'm sorry, CPRC's meeting on Wednesday. So I will bring this up at that meeting and uh, get their <sighs> uh, their language. So it's okay. Words, and then we'll add it and bring it back to the next HSC meeting if that's okay with you. That's perfect. Thank you, and thank you for trying to get these through. I realize people shouldn't be waiting for a year, so thank you for getting these to us. And then the last thing, um, it's not on the agenda, but being that everyone probably watched the news and saw the commotion with the Northwestern students this weekend. Chief, I did ask um, City Manager Storley if you can just address that so that the um, community and the committee have an understanding of what's happening. And also if you can just address um, whatever you can share in terms of your plan for, your plan for um, election day. I know people have voiced a lot of concern around issues on election day. Yes, ma'am, Alderman. Uh, first of all, you know, I think there's some misunderstanding about what NIPAS is. And I want to make sure that the public understands what the entity of NIPAS really is. And uh, NIPAS is a multi-jurisdictional task force. And the purpose of NIPAS uh, is to provide immediate extra police manpower and equipment uh, at the scene of a police emergency. Uh, it is also to provide for an automatic and systematic response of police manpower teams. It also provides for contractual responsibilities and liabilities uh, to provide a broader area of coverage and to foster a cooperative spirit of police emergency planning to provide access to specialized manpower and equipment, which no one police department could afford. Now, if we, up north in the northeastern suburbs, NIPAS and the mobile field force is one entity. Uh, we, we did not utilize the NIPAS EST, which is the SWAT team. Uh, those uh, uh, teams would be called out if we had a barricaded gunman, a hostage barricade situation, a takeover bank robbery or something of that nature. But the team that we did call for assistance for and the manpower because we would not have been able to control the situation with the uh, limited manpower we have on the police department and still cover our responsibilities 
in other parts of the city. So we called in the uh, uh, mobile field force team. And the mobile field force, let me give you what they say uh, so you have the exact wording on what the mobile field force is. The purpose of the mobile field force is to work with civil disturbances, union conflicts, public demonstrations, and other events involving large or disorderly crowds, uh, which require a skillful response by police agencies. Uh, the police role can range from a mere presence to offensive tactics and even to deadly force if required. The events of the, of the uh, recent years have clearly identified the need for specific training and development of tactics to handle these unusual events. So, uh, all of the suburbs, Bernie Hills, you may have heard of some out in Oak Brook, I believe. Uh, when we had these mass demonstrations with the police department, we're probably dealing with 25 or 30 personnel that we have on hand. So in order for us to manage these large crowds, we request the assistance of NIPAS and the mobile field force uh, aspect of NIPAS in order to help us have that specialized training uh, and professional training in managing large crowds, disorderly crowds, and things of that nature. So uh, they were on scene, the mobile field force was on scene uh, uh, Saturday. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a, a regiment of about 40 mobile field force people, coupled with uh, our, our manpower here from the Everston Police Department which may have been another uh, 35 or 40 people. And we were outnumbered with, with that amount of personnel. So, uh, you know, each incident, uh, we try to judge what we think would be appropriate in terms of having the appropriate amount of personnel on the scene. Now we went through uh, protests. We had protests here all summer in front of the police station. And up until Saturday, we had approximately 20 uh, protests by the uh, Northwestern uh, University mm -hmm. Police. And we had not made any arrests, uh, but none of those other situations had elevated to the level of violence, which was perpetrated Saturday night. Uh, we have had in the past uh, 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 criminal damage with respect to graffiti, uh, windows broken out and things of that nature. And we didn't make any arrests, but we drew the line when our officers started get, to get injured. Uh, it was a dangerous, we had people throwing bricks. We had uh, 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 lasers being pointed in the officer's eyes. Uh, we had public destruction of our business district. And as we all know, our business district is really in a turmoil, not only uh, financially, but trying to maintain uh, uh, people that want to come and visit our town. So uh, that's why we utilized the force that was necessary. Uh, we don't think it was unreasonable. And uh, we we limited our arrest to that one person that uh, did a, a injury to a police officer. So uh, that's that's basically what I have to say right now. Thank you. Any hey. questions from the committee? Todd, yeah, right uh, thank you, Alderman Quetz. Uh, Plum. Chief Cook, I think you may have touched on this, but I recall over the weekend we saw a number of different posts on, on social media that was a little bit confusing in terms of the origin of the fireworks. Can you share again just so two quick question. There were fireworks that was being shot off. I think you mentioned the laser dots. Uh, just where was the fireworks coming from? And then the second question that I have in terms of the the use of force, do the officers who come in from the offside agencies chief have the authority to use whatever force necessary to control the crowd? Or are you responsible for allowing that? I don't know if that's the best way to ask, but I think you know where I'm getting at. Yes. Uh, so the fireworks on your first question, were being launched from that crowd. And they, they were, I think they were mortars 
mm-hmm. that they were aiming at the police officer, the rocket would shoot out and then blow up in front of the police officer. We got all of this stuff on video. You're more than welcome uh, to come down, all the men, and take a look. Uh, Thank you. So we had uh, that type of violence, the bricks, the lasers, the rockets, and things of that nature were coming from uh, the Northwestern University student crowd. Um, and with respect to when, when we invite any agency into this town to mitigate a situation that may be beyond our control or expertise or equipment use or anything of that nature, I am the one that authorized them to come in and they here at the behest of me as a police chief. And they have the authority uh, to utilize force under state and federal guidelines as as a, a police officer here in Evanston. Now, under no circumstance will I invite uh, any uh, task force, uh, not only uh, NIPAS, but any task force in our town and watch a situation that I don't approve of. Uh, in any of these situations, when these when these uh, uh, entities come in our town to serve the public for us, uh, they work at the behest of me or my designee, which would be a deputy chief or a police commander. So we do monitor what goes on, and we are in control of of saying no to what we believe is unreasonable. Thank thank you very much, Chief. And this is this is an assumption assumptive question. I, I think just based on the fact that Northwestern students yesterday decided, I, I wasn't able to go over there, but there was no real protesting. Instead, they were on campus, uh, uni- you know, unifying between themselves, if that's a real word. My, my question is, there's an assumption that some of the violence that we saw over the weekend may not have come from students, but other people looking to take advantage, agitate the crowd, and do the, the violence. Do you have any information to offset that or give us a little bit better understanding of who's actually causing the damage? Yes. Well, we can't say specific mm-hmm. who is actually doing the damage, mm-hmm. but they the, the group met up at uh, Clark and Sherry. Mm-hmm. And they formulated the large group there. Now, all of these uh, entities that showed up, uh, from what I'm understanding, uh, not all of them were Northwestern students. It was some anarchy groups okay. uh, and some Antifa uh, uh, folks, from what I understand, from my intelligence officer. And they marched downtown. They marched over down Clark to the administration building of Northwestern University, graffiti that up. Uh, then they lit flares, which became a source of concern for me because sure. at the previous event, they had started setting fires uh, in the middle of the street. Mm-hmm. And I, my frame of mind then switches to protecting our, our business district, uh, mm-hmm. protecting uh, our residents' personal property and things of that nature. Uh, they then marched down. Uh, they went uh, southbound on Oregon to mm-hmm. church. And they went eastbound on church uh, to just east of uh, the alley uh, by just east of the main library entrance and stopped. And that's where the violence started. Uh, they opened the umbrellas. Uh, bricks were launched. I asked, uh, where did those bricks come from uh, when it was over by one of the task force commanders? And they said it was a young lady that had a, a cart full of bricks. So it was it was apparent to us that they came to uh, start violence in our town. My job mm-hmm. is here to protect. You know when uh, when someone sends they I got a, my son is in law school at LSU, and I send him down there. I want him to be protected. All right, mm-hmm. and that's my job as a police chief. Here is to protect all citizens, Northwestern students, mm-hmm. and everyone else. And um, that was my goal that night, was to minimize what possible conflict uh, could could erupt into someone getting seriously injured. Not only the Northwestern students, 
but the police officers and uh, the, uh, the police departments that came in here to assist us is to make it a situation that's uh, uh, pleasant for everyone. Do your sure. First Amendment right, but once you start uh, injuring police officers, uh, vandalizing businesses, throwing bricks, uh, using laser lights that could damage someone's eye, uh, I think that's where uh, we had to draw the line. And we did that in a way that was minimal. Uh, I hope that the message could be conveyed to uh, the students that we here to let you protest peacefully. We did that for 20 incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, they marched. We spent a lot of money uh, getting these cops in here to work. Uh, and no arrests were made all summer up until last night. And that's sure. the university students pushed it to a level of violence that was uh, it was dangerous for the police officer and even for the innocent bystanders that were sure. in that area. Sure. If, I, I don't know the best way to state it, Chief, but I think we all realize over the last four years and particularly most recent days leading up to this election that there are people that are out there that are looking to take advantage of a good cause. And yeah. that's, that's clear to me, and I'm sure it's clear to you. So I think they're scheduled to go another 10 days. Um, and I'm just hoping that that message can be conveyed to Northwest. I mean, earlier we heard comments. I had to step off the call for a moment in terms of reaching out to the university, but I would agree with you. That is a, a definite, a strong message that needs to be conveyed probably to the student body. And I would even go so far to say their parents for those kids that are under the age of 21, that they need to be very mindful of their rights to protest and be very mindful of those that will come from outside of our community to take advantage. So I would encourage you and I will pass along the same concern to our mayor and city manager that we're doing everything that we can, particularly on the eve of, of an election. So thank you very much for your service and your report. And then real quick, Chief, um, can you just give us a real quick idea of convey for our citizens of uh, the safety plan for the election tomorrow? Yes, we have a we have a thorough safety plan that's in effect. Uh, we we count some days off for police officers to be here. We're going to be patrolling the uh, poll sites. Uh, we've instructed our officers not to enter the poll sites unless requested, uh, or or if we get a call of some violence inside of a poll site. Other than that. They're going to be patrolling uh, the lots and the, and around these election sites. Uh, the mobile field force, which we had at the Northwestern University uh, protest Saturday, we will have limited access to them on election night because they got to serve the whole northeastern part of Illinois. So the closest mobile field force people will be in a location. Uh, where we can get to them quickly and they can get here. Uh, so that is our plan and that'll last for the whole week of uh, uh, through Friday of uh, this week. All right, thank you very much. Thank Hopefully you. we have no incidents, but given yeah, we have no, we have no everything we have going on in 2020, I think it's better to be prepared. Yeah, we have no intelligence. We, uh, you know, we in, in um, in uh, conversation with the uh, state of Illinois, uh, the, the statewide terrorism network, the FBI. Uh, we have people here that are assigned to the FBI. He was in here today. We have no intelligence of any violence, but we are prepared to deal with uh, situations that may come up. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Does yes, anyone sir. on the committee have a referral or any new business they wanna bring up at this time? No. All right. So seeing that we have no more conversation, I move that we adjourn. So move. Second. Second. Thank you. Nicola, do we need a roll call for that? Yes. Okay. Alderman Fisk? Yes. Alderman Braithwaite? Yes. Alderman Simmons? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Thank you. So that means we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.